My name is Jason, uh, and I'm one of the founders of Sego Mini. Uh, we are based in Toronto. We make kids' apps. You'll see some. Um, it's funny because, like, uh, Duster Magic, I normally get to save a lot of my ideas about sort of perspective and thinking like a, like through a child's sort of uh, mindset, and and uh, it's sort of business models is not really on on the topic. Uh, and then I show up last night, and like that apparently is what all, everyone's talking about. <laughs> so there's none of that in this presentation, but let's we can do some Q and A uh, afterward. Um, before I start, I also had to give a shout out to this man. Does anybody know who this is? Are you? Yeah. Hey, Mr. Dressa. Mr. Dressa. <laughs> so. The Canadians in the room will know this guy. So I heard uh, Mr. Rogers made a, 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 a an appearance, an appearance. Uh, and I and I have this thing where now anybody who brings up Mr. Rogers, I have to bring up Mr. Dresser. So uh, it's, it's just a thing. It's my patriotic duty. Uh, so uh, Fred Rogers and this man Ernie Coombs were both Americans uh, and moved to Toronto to set up. Mr. Rogers. The original Mr. Rogers was a Canadian Broadcasting Corporation project. And uh, they worked together, uh, Ernie Coombs was sort of Fred Rogers' understudy, and a few years later, uh, Fred Rogers moved back to the States and started uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And the year before that, uh, Ernie Coombs made the decision to stay, became Canadian, and started his own show uh, called Mr. Dressa. And Sorry? Who put them both on TV for the first oh, time? Oh, please tell me. Fred Rainsbury. Okay. Uh, CBC Children's. Yeah, CBC Children's. And it, it's uh, so so huge influence for Canadians growing up in this era. Um, and one of my favorite stories is that uh, the characters here are Casey and Finnegan. And uh, Casey was never uh, given a gender. And whenever uh, kids would ask uh, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Dressup, sorry, uh, is Casey a boy or a girl, he would always answer, what do you think? And then whatever they responded, he'd be like, yeah, that's right. Uh, and and uh, that was very ahead of his time. Yeah. Uh, this, is, this is, we're talking 1969. Uh, so very quick introduction uh, to what we do. Um, our first kids app uh, was Sound Shaker, it was done in 2009. At the time, I was running a digital agency doing service work for other people. Um, it was partly through attending a Duster Magic event in New Jersey when the iPad, I think, had just been announced that got me uh, particularly enthusiastic about doing this. Um, but none of our clients were interested. None of the funding agencies we applied to were interested. Um, and we went ahead and started making these things ourselves anyway. Um, Sound shaker is this very simple little app and now exists sort of a sound box where you kind of shake the device and these balls bounce around and it makes music. Um, but the whole notion was like, let's stop looking at this as a tiny computer screen and let's think about this as sort of a physical object that you can interact with. Um, I've been to a Silomar once before. Uh, and I can tell how long ago it was because this is my daughter who you'll see in some uh, other photos is now seven. Uh, we discovered that she really did not like the beach. Uh, she kept saying, Mindy, 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 because the sand kept blowing in her face. That feels like a long time ago when you see kid photos. It's strange how this works. Um, so a lot has happened since then. In 2011, I was talking about uh, the Stella and Sam apps we were doing, and Sego Mini was a, sort of, wasn't even a glimmer uh, at that point. Um, story is, I met uh, Bjorn Jeffrey in Los Angeles at a terrible kids digital conference whose name will remain, uh, I won't say it, and we basically spent the afternoon ranting about the state of uh, things and became fast friends. And then we, uh, Toka Boko was having a lot of success at that point, and he kind of said to me, he's like, Jason, what would you do if you didn't have any clients? And I thought, is this hypothetical or is this not? And, and, uh, Long story short, um, we set up a new studio based in Toronto to sort of act as a sister studio, Toka Boka, and he and I kind of established what the strategy would be, which would be to focus on uh, apps for two to five year olds. Um, so we have since published uh, 23 apps, um, 24 if you want to include World. 
Uh, they all have a common uh, art style and aesthetic, um, and they are all looked at. We all they're all conceived as digital toys based around sort of open-ended play. Uh, and I will mention our next app is going to be called Hats, and that will be out in a little bit. Um, and then, of course, uh, ten days ago, we launched a subscription service, World, um, which makes 20 of the apps available together, bundled into one service, uh, where you can choose to subscribe, and where we're still publishing the standalone app, so you can choose to keep paying. Um, and it sounds like you guys have been talking about this. So <laughs> let's, but let's save that for the Q&A. Um, and more recently, toys. Um, I have the best job in the world right now um, because uh, I'm doing a lot of fun things and among them uh, I have a small team of industrial designers and we are basically developing physical products that you know, we feel bring over the spirit and the ideas uh, of the digital toys um, and it's been uh, remarkable, it's been amazing. Okay, the blank screen. Uh, so I'm going to that was the like, who am I, blah, blah, blah part, and then I just want to talk a little bit about um, the challenge that we have as designers. Um, and it's not, it's not a straightforward one. Of how do you design uh, for kids who are three, who cannot read, cannot write, who often don't have any of the preconceived notions uh, that we have as adults. Uh, and this is a central struggle uh, that, that we have and any of you who work in this space are familiar with. Um, I, I take and collect photos like this. Uh, this one, I was in Stockholm three weeks ago, and when you get out of the Toka office, you take a little ferry, and you get off, and you start walking into the city, and you, you encounter this. Um, so when you're designing, some, somebody, some urban planner, designer, decided this is where people should walk, and then this is where people actually want to walk. <laughs> And you see, once you see this image, you will see it everywhere. Oh, yeah. University campuses, parks, all over the place. Do you know there's a name for those? Okay. Dream paths. Dream paths. Dream paths. Or desire paths. Desire paths. Um, or get off my lawn. Get off my lawn. It's just poor grass. So if, you're, if your audience is sort of the typical audience, you have some options. Uh, you can put up a big sign, keep off the grass. You can you know, direct people in various ways. You can put up a big fence. Uh, or you can just put the path where people actually want it. Um, and I'd argue that uh, for, for younger kids, uh, these other options are just really not even available um, in terms of directing people to, to follow the process that you have conceived for them. And when you're designing a digital app, uh, we all have this preconceived notion of this is the path that I expect and I want and I aspire the kids to follow, but too often we are trying to force and channel these uh, users into this specific path. And the mechanisms that one would use uh, with an adult audience are, are just disastrous um, with a younger audience. Um, so the key is to go with the grain, to figure out the flow and go with the flow. Um, so, a reminder of our audience, uh, here's Charlotte again, but a year and a half after uh, the last trip to Asilomar, um, having miso soup while dressed as a tiger. Um, and she's a bit sad. She's a sad tiger. I forget what the story was there. Mm -hmm. um, you told us last time you showed it. I don't remember the story. Okay. Um, but uh, I like this picture because it's just a reminder of like, and I, you know, I throw this up at work sometimes, like, this is who we're talking to. This is who we're dealing with. Um, you going to explain to her why she should use your app this way and not that way? Does that really look like that's going to be a successful, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, conversation? Um, we are humble servants to, 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 to these people. And, uh, you know, they fundamentally see the world through a different perspective that, that we as adults will never fully appreciate. Um, uh, my earliest memories are really start around five. I know some people go a little bit earlier than that. Um, but it, I wouldn't even begin to imagine uh, uh, what, what the world looked like at this point. So how do you tackle this challenge of, of, of getting 
uh, sort of a sense of perspective. Um, here's one idea. Uh, so this is uh, Peter Opvix. He's an industrial designer, and he's best known for the trip track chair, which is that chair that he on the right. And you'll see this. It's a, it's a you know, popular uh, you know, by the, in North America now. Um, and he built this version of his furniture, uh, the chair on the left, for his design team to sort of appreciate the, the, the challenges of physical scale and how the built environment is not built for little kids. It's one of these things we take for <coughs> all the time. Uh, my wife is about five foot two, so she reminds me a lot <laughs> of like, well, I can't reach this, I can't reach that. Um, but as a, as a three-year-old, uh, I remember having to put padding around all our countertops because she would just smack right into the counter, you know, all the time. And the shelves, there's this, uh, this, this fundamental thing which a child walks into a room and instantly everything is telling it, her, him, or her, this is not for you. Um, so you need to build empathy, and this, this, this I thought was a really clever way of doing it. But when you think about the sort of psychological process of what people are thinking, that's a little harder. Um, one of my big points of inspiration was this book, some of you might be familiar with, The Design of Everyday Things. Um, uh, came out in the late 80s, and his whole thing was about how design is, you have to think of it as a communication between an object and a user. In our case, it might be an app and a person. And design is the thing that mediates that conversation. Uh, and, uh, you know, for adults, often it's words, it's instructions, it's all these sorts of things. Um, but for a child, it's, it's not, that's not going to work. It's, it's got to be a deeper than that. And these, uh, again, you have to sort of develop a, an eye for these things and a sensibility for it. Um, because it's... it's uh, it's like every door handle. You know, it's just there, and once you start opening your eyes, you're like, why is this door handle intuitive and this one's not? Um, it, you know, it can, can go hidden. Um, and this phrase I lifted right out of the book, which is intuitive guidance presence in the design. So this idea that in, inherent in the way that something is designed and put together, whether it's a, a teapot or whatever, there are inherent intuitive things that just sort of guide you, um, not even necessarily on a super conscious level as to how you're supposed to use it. And so when you're designing for, again, the sort of two to five age group, uh, this, this is essential. It's essential for grown-ups, it's just that we have better band-aids that we can put over them. Um, so imagine you're a preschool child and you come across this. <laughs> What are we looking at? Buttons. Yeah, buttons. The red one looks fun. That looks cool. I think that one. You know, so okay, that's maybe a good example of like that's an important feature. Turn the TV on and off. And it's big red and round and that looks pretty inviting. Uh, the colored ones down at the bottom look kind of interesting because they're different than the other ones. They've got colors on them. Uh, but what you see here are really an artifact of like layers of history and abstraction. What is a channel? Even to a six-year-old today, what is a channel? That doesn't really mean anything. What is a source? Uh, so you start looking at the label these buttons, and uh, this is just a bit of a non-starter in terms of uh, young kids. Even adults have trouble with it. Uh, yes, myself included. Every, every hotel you go to, you spend a morning amount of time dealing with this. Um, so, so a doorbell. Okay, this is more like it. Um, you've got this uh, nice tactile feedback. You've got some audio that goes with it. It's immediate. You hear that sound. Uh, my daughter would go to a friend's house and hit the doorbell and, and go inside and immediately go back outside, do it all over again. Mm -hmm. This was such a satisfying thing, right? And it's just, it's also followed by this immediate sense of anticipation, who's coming to the door, are they home, who's it going to be, is it going to be the mom, is it going to be the kid, um, and then you get this little surprise, and then you get this, ah, you know, and this is something, like, this is going to be leading to something, it's leading to a play date, it's leading to a visit with uh, my mom, um, all these sort of positive feelings associated with it. 
So what is this? The wall stepping stone. Yeah. There you go. Uh, so this was in, she's a little bigger now. Uh, this was in uh, Copenhagen uh, last uh, two weeks ago. Uh, fantastic uh, playgrounds in Scandinavia in general. And I have a few more photos. Um, but, uh, but this as a design is one of my favorites. And you see different iterations and versions of this uh, all over the place. Um, but again, if you look at it in this very reductionist view, it's a bunch of logs, and you add a kid, and off you go. And we were immediately inventing different games and races to, to, in terms of how we're going to use this. Um, I found another photo. This was from a trip uh, to Amsterdam. Same idea. This was concrete. Uh, Charlotte was about three at this point. And again, uh, really good in terms of age range. Like you can use it one way as a two-year-old, another way as a four-year-old. But actually, as a seven and eight-year-old, and I saw even like when we were there, there was 10, 11, 12-year-olds inventing more and more challenging ways of using this. That's a big win for me. Uh, what is this? Yeah. Uh, it's uh, you know you could have a few things, but it I mean. You, you, you train yourself to this, but if you're a kid and you're not familiar with this iconography, this works a lot better. <laughs> this again, from this is a park in the middle of Denmark. I love, I love this, and my daughter is cracked up over it. And I was like, wow, what a, what a smart design. You just, you just solved, the, solved the problem immediately, this universal language. I'm like, yeah, I know what that means. <laughs> Uh, what is this? Trampoline. <laughs> ah. <laughs> this is the greatest invention ever, as far as my daughter is concerned. <laughs> you get these, we saw these all over the place. We saw these in Berlin, we saw these in Copenhagen as well. Um, this one was just nicely placed right into the grass, so it's just flush. And if you looked at it from a distance, you'd have no idea. And I walked right past several of these before it was her who saw some other kid on one and immediately went bonkers. Mm -hmm. um, there's another one in Copenhagen which is right in the sidewalk. So you're walking along the sidewalk and then it just transitions, it's gray, it almost matches. Uh, and she couldn't get off of this. Poor yeah. elderly woman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was no safety uh, rail or anything. Um, but again, this idea of like, it's just kind of there, it's just kind of present, it's kind of unassuming, uh, but boy does it ever capture, uh, you know, just brings the joy out. Um, here's another one, I warned you there's going to be a lot of playground photos. That's good. Um, and, and, and again, the reason why I look at a lot of playgrounds is that I like to look at the beginning of every, of our, every app as the entrance into a playground. Mm -hmm. Right? You don't have instructions when you arrive at the playground. You don't, you're not told, okay, here's the list of things you're going to do now. You're just plunked in there, and if it's designed well, uh, then you will, you will sort things out. You will, you will find the fun, and you'll find how to use it that's the best way for you. If you're interested, if you're, uh, my daughter likes heights, which I don't. So this creates a very entertaining situation for her because she insists that we climb everything that she can find, including this, which was monumental. So we, these have started to show up in Toronto a few years ago, these climbing structures. But this thing was uh, probably 30 feet tall in, in the middle. I've never seen one quite this big. Um, but she just sort of raced right to the top. Paris, that's a bunch of this. Yeah, yeah, they're great. Um, and again, like they, they're, they are empowering in terms of the kid can go to great height, but they're relatively safe because they're, 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 you can't really fall very far without um, getting uh, caught in something. Um, and, uh, and you can, again, you can play with them in different ways. You see kids playing tag on these. That's pretty crazy. Um, so again, uh, I think it's worth thinking about, thinking about, you know, that first... 10, 15 seconds of your app after you've hit the, the, the icon as you've just walked into this playground. 
and the, the best design apps for this age group, I feel, are the ones that, that give you an invitation, give you a bunch of cool stuff to play with, and let you have at it. Um, so a few, three, sort of three top takeaways here. Find natural affordances. Um, so if you can, um, if you can find something that looks like it should slide, then the kids will probably try to slide it. Um, and think about physical uh, uh, versions of things that would slide, um, and that would help give it a cue. Um, guide with a light touch. So you need to sometimes give a little prompting uh, or a little guidance as to how to use an interface. But look for the sort of lowest, most unobtrusive way of doing it. Um, so a classic example of this is like if there's, we use a lot of timeouts in our apps where we give them a very kind of open-ended interface, but if we don't get any response from the kid after even like three seconds, there's a pretty good chance that they're, they're feeling like they're not quite sure what to do next. And then we'll give something a little wiggle. Um, and if it is, for example, something that's supposed to slide, then maybe we'll slide it in right when they arrive at that scene. Just a slight movement in that axis is all that's needed to say like, oh, I get it, that goes left and right. Um, so always look for the sort of smallest possible way and play test that. And a lot of the time, it's, um, it doesn't take much. Very gentle push. And then, again, uh, think about your work as setting the stage. So don't think about your work as I am, you know, the child is going to follow these steps and then therefore end in this wonderful experience. Uh, you have to kind of offer up, you know, make a playground and then offer it up uh, for the kid to do uh, what they need to do there. Um, but it's an important distinction between sort of setting the stage, getting things kind of prepared. You do need to provide sometimes a little bit of inspiration, a little bit of uh, maybe a little story starter or a little nudge. Um, but, you know, don't try to dictate the overall experience because that just is not going to work. Um, I think the two, you know, the, the, one of the best <coughs> Uh, skills you can have in this space as a designer for young kids is humility. Um, I've been doing this for a long time and a lot of time we end up in debates around uh, within the team. So you should do things this way, do things that way. And I always tell people like, if you want to win an argument, just show me. You know, just show me it in action uh, and and I will, I will relent. Um, and so we play test a lot. Um, Virtually every week we have a group of kids into the office. Uh, you'll see we have a little rake here so we can videotape what they're doing out with their fingers. Uh, this is Davin, one of our play designers. And we try to create just a very kind of relaxed atmosphere for them to kind of feel their way through things. Uh, and, and we just observe. And then we will often now take the video footage um, and put it into little clips for the developers. Because, you know, a lot of the time the developers are like, yeah, but that, you know, Maybe that was this other thing, or maybe that was this other thing. But it's very hard for them to argue with a, with a little video clip of the kid repeatedly going like, uh, 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 then, 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 then they get it. Um, also having that artifact means that sometimes the team can look at it and go, actually, that is a problem, but it's not the problem you thought it was. Sometimes they'll figure out that it's actually something completely different, they'll find their own solutions. Uh, so just a few pictures um, from our day-to-day. Uh, -day. Um, again, this is sort of really essential to keep ourselves in tune uh, with our audience um, and, uh, and, and see how they are approaching things. Um, I wanted to make a note about the role of parents in all of this. And it's kind of fraught because we do, we do talk to parents. Uh, we get feedback from parents. Um, but we often have to weigh it with the evidence that we see in front of us from the kids. Um, so when we ask parents what they would like from us, inevitably they go to curriculum-based education topics. Uh, inevitably they go to um, more instruction and more guidance. Um, and 
it's hard for them to appreciate the like yes, that will remove this immediate pain of your your not your your feeling of uncertainty, your feeling of anxiety. Like I'm not sure what to do. I'm the parent. I'm supposed to understand everything here. And by giving instruction and clear guidance, you check that box, um, but you also kind of do harm to the kid's experience. Um, I was at a talk recently at another conference when a kid's app developer was espousing, they were talking about an interface they had, it was fairly intuitive and, and you just kind of went in and you, you tap a character and you start playing. And they said that the parents were really frustrated because they didn't know what to do. And, uh, and so their solution was they put lots of hinting all over the place. Uh, and so suddenly there is like within a second there's a little button, a little icon that comes up, so tap here, tap here, tap here. The thing starts pulsing and big circles appear on all the hot spots. <coughs> and I think that's a terrible idea. Um, it was one of those things where I was like, I was sitting there listening to it, I was like, well, that's interesting, I think it's good to get feedback from parents. And then shortly afterward I was like, that's the worst idea ever. <laughs> um, and it reminded me a bit of this quote. Um, which is again one of my favorites. It just goes back and back. I'm sure many of you are very familiar with it. Um, but this notion of, you know, we're not here necessarily, you know, as, a, as an app developer for young kids, it's not our job to get the kid from A to B as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And classic usability testing is all about that. How do we design this app so that you can book your hotel faster and you can, you know, get to your destination quicker? Um, I'm not looking for kids to like, you know, get from A to B faster. I'm looking for them to have a more meaningful and deep engagement and experience with that. And every time we just short circuit it by putting all those instructions and prompts in it, uh, we take away that opportunity for the kid through natural experimentation to figure something out in a way that a parent should. Um, and I think it's one of the, you know, if you want evidence, I'd say go to Minecraft. Uh, you know, my daughter has just entered the developmental stage of Minecraft. And it's bewildering to me. Um, but, you know, together we're figuring it out. And I think that that experience of figuring it out together is, in many respects, more valuable and more interesting than the gameplay itself. Like, she's learning stuff and telling me. She's learning stuff from her friends. They're talking about stuff. And if Minecraft was structured in such a way that it was like, okay, this is exactly how you do it, A, B, C, D, uh, we, none of that would have happened. All those conversations, all that interaction, all that learning by experimentation. Uh, you know, my wife's really deep into it now, and like sometimes, you know, she'll I'll find her up at night, and the next day we go into the Minecraft world, and she shows off some, you know, colored, brightly colored sheep or something that she pulled off. Um, anyways, so with that ends the me talking, rambling part of the presentation. And now we can talk about questions. Mm -hmm.